snapping hip. Next, please. So there are, there are kind of two general areas to talk about, internal versus external. I'll just kind of briefly go through both of them. Um, I can tell you that with the external snapping hip, it's a relatively rare disorder. Uh, what I've seen, in, at least in my practice, the, the, probably the most common patient that I've seen has been a hockey goalie that keeps landing on their side and, and really just irritating that area and causing almost like a secondary bursitis with a tight IT band. Um, most of the time you can get these patients through, uh, through PT and with a couple of injections and actually get them to improve. Um, sometimes you can't. So the, uh, the, other, the other thing that's a problem here is you want to make sure, as I, as I mentioned before with the CAM impingement, you want to make sure that you're not dealing with some other pathology. You, you want to make sure that you don't have something funny like synovochondromatosis or a post-traumatic loose body. Labral tears can also cause snapping and internal snapping from the psoas, which we'll talk a little bit later. Next. This is sort of the classic patient, and, and I wish I had 100 of these because these are nice high school athletes, usually young, thin patients, easy to deal with. And you can see on this one, it, you, could, you can see the, the popping a mile away. If they can reproduce it like this, it's great. A lot of times they tell you that their hip dislocates. That's sort of the most common history that you get. And the parents say, oh yeah, you, you got to look at this. He, she can pop her hip out every time. And, and it's not a dislocation at all. It's just the snapping. Next, please. So the reasons for external snapping, as, as you can see, we have not just the external, the thickening, but a lot of times it's a more focal thickening of the posterior portion of the IT band. Sometimes it's actually snapping of the gluteus, um, the, the maximus tendon actually can snap as well. Sometimes abductor weakness can, can, show, can present itself like snapping. And a lot of times it can be secondary, as I mentioned before, from, uh, from CAM and other, and other type. A lot of times my, my most common problem that I see with my post-op CAMs in the older population is a very tight IT band secondarily. So you need to look for that post-operatively as well. Somewhere around three or four months post-op, a lot of times they'll come in with tight IT band because now that they've got all this hip rotation, their IT band is still pretty tight. So that's something else to look out for. Next, please. Um, again, patients a lot of times will tell you, especially the younger kids, that their hip comes out of place. And they'll show you this maneuver and they'll say, oh yeah, look, it's coming out of place. So make sure and, and, and document and tell the parents that no, it's not the, the hip coming out of place. The classic thinking between, uh, between the internal and external snapping is if you can see it, it's external snapping. If you can hear it, it's internal snapping. And that's kind of a good rule of thumb to kind of separate your exam. Next, please. Um, next. So radiographs, one of the things, this, is, this drives me crazy. Here's a huge bursa, and you can see what they've done. They've actually put the cursor, and they actually didn't even bother to include the, uh, this is just a scout image. And so a lot of times, if you're not looking for IT band issues or for bursitis or gluteus medius tears, it's important to make sure that your radiologist knows what you're looking for, because a lot of times they'll miss some obvious pathology. Here's an example. It doesn't project very well, but there's, a, there's actually an osteophyte here on the AP view that sometimes you can pick up on. And, and those, I've seen a handful of patients with calcific tendonitis around that area as well. It does happen just like in the, in the rotator cuff. Here's an example of very large bursa. You can see a pretty significant asymmetry from right to left. And in those older patients, probably in the 55 to 60 year old range, you're going to see some partial and sometimes near uh, complete tears of the gluteus medius as well that, that can be repaired. We're not going to talk about that, but that's just another thing. Um, next, please. One more. And then you'll see. A lot of times, this is the normal anatomy, gluteus medius, anteriorly. Here's a complete tear of the gluteus medius. So the sagittal images, a lot of times, are your best images to pick up gluteus medius tears in these patients. Next, please. One of the things that I have incorporated into my practice is diagnostic ultrasound. Here's an example. You can see really just great anatomy um, with these ultrasound devices. So here's the, the medius. Anyway, it's, oh, there it is. The medius right here, iliotibial band. Next, please. Here's an example of a, of a snapping hip. So you can see it. And I'm going to diagram it out for you in a second here. Next, please. So when we look at the anatomy, here's the IT band, gluteus medius, greater trochanter. So I've got the probe sitting 
sideways on the hip, and we're just looking right at the focal anatomy, right where you can feel the snap. Next, please. So as we have the patient in external rotation, here's the area of the prominence. Next. And then as we move her, it starts to engage. Next. And then there's where it's already, this is the prominence here, and it's already snapped over. Next. And so now I'm going to run it again so you can kind of appreciate a little bit more. You can kind of see that snap and actually a lot of times palpate it right there. So you can really document the area of snapping very nicely with ultrasound. Next, please. Here's the mainstay, and I think we're all familiar with injections. I use three as a, as a rough guide. I always like to do one injection myself, uh, despite some patients will go and see their primary care doc, or maybe they see some other doctor not sure exactly where they inject them. I always want to document that they did get some relief if they're painful with one injection. Uh, the classic procedure of Victor Eliza Lituri from Mexico City has written a lot about this, and this is the technique that we use. Basically, I create a pocket subcutaneously. We create a diamond shape incision in the IT band and basically decompress the area. Next, please. And this is what it looks like. This is the IT band as we see it before we enter into it. Then we create that diamond shaped area and we expose the entirety of the trochanter after we're doing the bursectomy. Next, please. And this is a quick, uh, I think it's like a one minute video looking at the technique that I use. And so what we do is we put the patient in the lateral decubitus position. Uh, what I like to do is I have to, I, I have several pillows, uh, and so that you want to have the arm, or the arm, you want to have the leg in some abduction so that the IT band is relatively relaxed. I make a portal about a centimeter above the tip of the trochanter and another portal at the, at the base of the trochanter, and you can palpate that pretty easily in most patients. We fill this area, this is marking going in. So you're basically creating a pocket lateral to the IT band. In skinny patients, it's important to, to be sure that you're above it. And you can feel that sort of gritty sensation and know that you're in this area. A lot of times, you'll see me come in here with the, with the shaver. Now what I, what I tend to use, this video is probably about two years old now, and what I've gone to using uh, actually is to use the ablator almost exclusively. So I try to stay away from the shaver because the shaver sometimes there's a lot of those perforators that you just don't see until later when they come back with a hematoma. And so what I've gone to doing is to expose the pocket, and you'll see now you're kind of starting to see the, the IT band, so you need to open it up from proximal to distal, and you can use your electrocautery, and you can use this hook probe, or you can use the other uh, more fancy, um, you know, arthrocare type of device. There's the IT band. You have to be one of the, the tricky parts here is sometimes the, the, uh, the, the tendon or the, uh, the muscle of the tensor actually inserts a little bit lower. So sometimes you'll run into muscle and it makes you a little nervous that maybe you're going through the abductor. If you move the leg and it doesn't move, then you know that's IT band and you still just haven't cut through it. So once we develop the four, the four flaps, basically what we do now is we go in here with the shaver and take out these four flaps and create the pocket and you can kind of see there's the bursal tissue. So now I'm shaving, this is posterior, and you have to be careful. You always have to, I always mark out the sciatic nerve so I remember not to be very aggressive posteriorly, obviously. And we kind of do about half of it from the front. Now we've kind of looked at this whole area. There's the gluteus medius. So we're looking proximal here. This is distal. Always want to make sure and see the, the band. The posterior part is usually where you'll see most of the thickening. You can actually do a piriformis release here if you really wanted to. I've done a handful of those now. And then you always want to see the, lateral, the, the vastus lateralis tendon as well. And make sure that you're all the way exposed the entire trochanter so that you eradicate all of the, all of the impingement. Next, please. As I mentioned, make sure with posteriorly that you don't get too aggressive back there. And you always want to ca cauterize all those penetrators. So like I said, I've gone to actually using the ablator to begin with. Next, please. In terms of, uh, there's not a lot of history behind this procedure yet. Victor uh, probably has the largest series. We're actually looking up, uh, I have 45 patients that one of my fellows this year is looking up and hopefully will show uh, good results with this kind of patient. Mm -hmm. It's a mix of not only snapping hip but also chronic bursitis. Next, please. So as impingement is the next area, and this is a little bit of a funny area. Next, please. With internal snapping, the, the classic sort of 
story is that a lot of these patients will have, as I said, audible snapping, not necessarily palpable snapping. It's a lot of times associated with low back workup. So I see a fair amount of these patients that have had a complete back workup without significant improvement. And a lot of the snapping occurs right at the iliopectineal eminence here anteriorly. And so it's important to do your release and make sure and be fairly aggressive with the release so that you eradicate the problem completely. Next, please. The, the classic maneuver, very similar to the fader maneuver that I described before to sort of diagnose the problem. And patients will actually do this on their own as well. So you bring them from flexion, adduction, internal rotation over towards abduction and then extension. A lot of times you can reproduce it. One of the classic things that you can do here is if you push down hard enough in that anterior space, a lot of times you can eradicate that popping. And then you know it's so a snapping that's actually taking place. Next, please. We see that commonly in dancers. I see it a lot in the, any of the, any of the kids that have retroversion or pincer type pathology, there's a fair amount of snapping that goes on in these patients. And I've become more and more aggressive in, in surgical release of the psoas, or at least a partial release in these patients. Next, please. Conservative treatment, um, the, the one area that I think is really cool, I'll show you an example is you can inject the psoas bursa, and, and traditionally we'd sent these patients to radiology to do it, and what I'm doing now is in the office uh, doing it using ultrasound. Next, please. And you can see here's the, the probe is sitting transverse right on the, on the patient anteriorly. You can see femoral head, femoral arteries over here, the psoas muscle, and then the sheath, and you can see it pretty well delineated. Next, please. Here's an example using Doppler just to kind of show you the anatomy a little bit better. The artery is here, the vein is here, femoral nerve is here, and then the psoas is over here. Next, please. When we come in, you can see my needle coming in. There's the psoas tendon. The artery is over here, femoral neck here. So we can get a very nice injection and document that we've actually gotten into the psoas sheath. And most patients will get better just with this the occasional failure, then I know that I've gotten into the right space and a release is probably going to work for these patients. Um, in terms of open release, uh, or internal snapping, sometimes you'll see this area of bruising of the labrum anteriorly, way medial, and that I think in, in a lot of cases is due to, and Brian Kelly has talked about this, um, basically psoas impingement over the labrum as well. So in the absence of a real labral tear with significant snapping, and this bruising, a lot of times, I think it's the psoas that's the problem. It's an overtight psoas, and you probably need to release it arthroscopically or, or open. Next, please. In terms of opening, uh, doing an open approach here is very difficult, big exposure, high incidence of HO. So there's a lot of good reasons to try to do it endoscopically. Next, please. Endoscopically, there's a couple different ways to do it. Um, when you, when you have patients that have a total hip, can you hit one more? See if the video will work here. Oh, go back, please. It's not working. Anyway, there's, a, there's one way to do it where you actually go extra articular and go right into the bursa here. Here it is. So using the ablator, you can see a very nice exposure of the tendon. So that's the entire psoas tendon right up against the left tuberosity. And you'll see here in a second, we'll take a fluoro. This, and this position will do it in, in the, the hip is in extension and external rotation. You can see where I am here. This is a patient that had a total hip. And that's my only indication for doing it in this way. And you can see you can pretty easily get to the entire psoas and do a complete release. And this is a patient that had had a total hip by, some, by one of my partners, actually, and had cup impingement. Next, please. The other, uh, the other ways to do it, next, please is to actually go from the central compartment. And I'll show you a window. You basically create a capsular window. Next, I'll show you this step by step here in a second. So the way the anatomy works here is here's the orbicular ligament. Here's the labrum, femoral neck. So we're looking from the anterolateral portal working through the anterior portal. And your psoas tendon is going to be sitting right in this area here. Next, please. And if, as we watch the video, there's the orbicular ligament now femoral neck here, labrum, and we've already started the capsular window, and you can see this is actually a 16-year-old, um, she's a gymnast and had had refractory tendonitis, actually on both sides. I had injected her, had gotten better for a period of time, 
but you can see as we get into the psoas sheath, you really had a pretty significant near complete tear of the psoas tendon. And so in those situations, you basically complete the tear and over a pro uh, my experience has been that over about a three month period, they reestablish their strength and they actually do really well. And this kid actually had bilateral uh, releases about six weeks apart. So you can see the more I release, the more pathology I see, the more anterior aspect is actually complete, near completely torn. Next, please. With respect to endoscopic releases, there are actually very good studies to show that it, most of the studies have actually shown that the, the, the findings are similar in terms of whether you do it from the peripheral compartment, the central compartment, or that lesser tuberosity approach. Uh, there have been case reports of the lesser tuberosity approach having HO, including in one of my patients. So I tend to do it more like what I just showed you from that peripheral view, because it's a technically easier and it's a safer approach with respect to any, any HO. Next, please. So as released in athletes, it's been documented collegiate in, um, in high school athletes. And you can see that even despite doing it at that lesser trochanter release, which in fact is actually a, a larger release, more of the tendon is involved uh, more distally. It's about 75% of the tendon as opposed to 50% in the peripheral compartment. Uh, most of them did well in that case, in that small group. Again, no, no large series. So in, in conclusion, snapping hip disorders are typically managed non-surgically, but if you do need to, to manage them surgically, there's very nice arthroscopic procedures. Uh, HO is definitely a risk with psoas tenotomy, so be wary of that if you do it particularly from that lesser tuberosity approach. Thanks.